welcome everybody to the new um, to the final ICP series with uh, lunch uh, seminars that we are holding. Uh, the idea of this is to present some key projects we are working on with uh, within ICP on a European funded projects and uh, which have to do with the heat, with the decarbonization of various sectors. In this one, we're going to speak about a study carried out for uh, on behalf of the European Climate Foundation on the heating decarbonization for the low income households in several countries. Uh, this study, actually, the purpose of that was to capture the current policy developments that we have on the, which were announced actually a couple of days ago on the new emissions trading scheme for the buildings and the transport uh, for the heating fuels that was uh, agreed within the European institutions uh, a few days ago, and this will be hold, held from 2027-2030. This is the so-called DTS2, as it's uh, quite well known in the debate. One of the agreements was that there will be a 45 euro per ton of CO2 ceiling price for these three years, and then it will be extended or they will see what will happen in the future. While uh, the cost, the extra costs that um, the extra cost of this scheme, in essence, uh, will be somehow smoothened by the Social Climate Fund, which is also proposed and uh, agreed at this stage, um, which is about with a budget of 45 billion to be dispersed in 2026, so one year before the introduction of the ETS2 scheme. And the funding source of the Social Climate Fund, it's uh, going to be the revenues from the emissions trading scheme, plus 25% co-financing from the member states. This will be, uh, of course, we have to keep in mind that next to the um, Social Climate Fund, there is a series of other funds that, uh, that are in place, and this we have to check carefully to what extent they will be useful and timely to capture the, um, this new policy scheme, the cost of this new policy scheme, as well uh, as other policies that will be in place in view of the Fit for 55 package. Uh, in, the, in the study, what we have been doing, and um, my colleague Marco will uh, continue explaining a bit the uh, overall of the study. So, what we have checked uh, carefully is the three uh, core policy instruments that are being proposed and partly agreed within the EU institutions. The first one, as we said, is the ETS2 uh, for the heating fuels. The second one is the well-known phasing out of uh, fossil fuel boilers, which in essence re refers to a ban on selling of new fossil fuel boilers uh, for oil, coal and gas, for instance, in newer existing buildings and gradually removing the old ones and substituting them either with boilers for uh, clean fuels or uh, electrification, heat pumps and so forth. And the last one is the introduction of a minimum energy performance standard. It was the old MEPS, as it was called a few months ago. Now, of course, we have uh, updates on that for the label d &E by 2030. Um, and this somehow is being proposed to the ABBD, so we have captured also the updates on the ABBD. I give the floor here to Marco to explain to you the background and the outcomes of the study. Marco, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so hello. Um, so we had, uh, well, as Les is explaining, we started with, let's say, this, this key policy that we wanted to analyze more. And then from this, we took some assumptions and considerations. Uh, so first of all, the, the baseline year was 2019. Uh, this was chosen as this is the year where there's uh, the most available data, let's say. And we targeted three main end uses, so space, heating, and cooking, and domestic producer. So we kept out cooking and uh, light, light appliances in this case. Uh, but these three are also the, let's say, the, the most utilized uh, and energy end users. They represent the biggest share of energy consumption. And then elasticities of demand, which essentially um, allow us to see, depending on um, the amount consumed of energy, how the price increases. And these were taken uh, at the national level. Um, and yeah, if it was not available for certain countries, then we would take some European average. Um, yeah, then moving on to, to let's say, the, the main bit. So how we calculated the final energy consumption increase, fuel price and fuel prices. So we took uh, two different prices, so ETS1 and ETS2. Uh, these were uh, gathered um, so from the EU scenario of 2020, uh, whereas uh, for the ETS1, whereas the ETS2 price was derived by a study uh, conducted by PV Economics. And um, as you can see on the graphs on the right, so this is, let's say, how, how it is projected for the ETS price to, to which is related to the emissions trading system uh, supported by the EU. 
Uh, and in the last graph down, we how, for example, gas, carbon, uh, and coal, and electricity prices uh, will augment the future. So moving on to the next slide. Let's see if you can move the slide. Yeah, so stemming from the, the, the policies we discussed previously, we, we came up with five scenarios, or let's say five plus one, because the first one is the baseline scenario. So this is the case in which, well, it is assumed that no additional policies would be implemented. Uh, and this is, let's say, just kept to, 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 to use it, of course, uh, as a comparison. Then uh, scenario one, uh, in this case, the, the projection of ETS2 prices were was considered. So basically, what will happen in these countries if the EU ETS scenario, uh, the UTS or trading system, which is currently being applied only to the industry sector, would also be applied to the residential sector. Uh, so that was the first scenario. Then the second scenario was uh, we we analyzed the mandatory phase out of heating oil uh, and solid fossil fuel, but also natural gas uh, boilers. And in this case, we considered um, phase out of all three types of boilers in 2035. So in reality, we consider that it would take you know, five years for this to occur. So let's say in 2040. Uh, these uh, fossil fuels will be completely phased out and replaced by heat pumps, uh, with the installation cost of the heat pumps being assumed to be equal to 10,000 uh, euros. The third scenario, um, so the yeah, we consider the establishment of the minimum energy performance standards, uh, which was previously mentioned, uh, but let's say a bit improved, so to really minimum energy, but performance, but let's say uh, a little bit better. In fact, uh, we assume that all uh, buildings would achieve energy class T in 2030 with renovation costs of 15,000 uh, per, per dwelling with uh, delivered energy savings of 40%. And then after five years, uh, all these buildings would be uh, upgraded even more to energy class C. So costing an additional 10,000 euros and uh, delivering additional final energy savings of 10%. And then we have scenario four, where we combine uh, scenario two and three, and scenario five, where we combine, uh, let's say, all uh, the first three scenarios. Um, so yeah, then moving onwards uh, to the next slide, what were our main findings from the first study? Because this is an update of a first study that was uh, conducted uh, in April uh, 2020. Um, so, even in the first case, it was found that uh, the minimum energy performance standards for buildings uh, was, let's say, the best performing policy. Um, and it would reduce uh, the lowest income households' energy costs by one third to 50 without harming the disposable income or even uh, boosting it. Meaning that uh, people would, let's say, there would be less energy consumption, but the, this would not affect the, um, the income that is spent on paying for these energy services. Um, we saw that uh, also introducing the carbon price on heating the energy poverty. Uh, essentially, this means that. The, let's say the target of this policy will not um, be correct uh, because we want to target the, let's say, the providers of energy rather than consumers. So we saw that this increase in prices would actually affect the consumer rather than the supplier, let's say, of energy. Uh, and of course, without uh, any of these policies being implemented, um, the energy consumption and uh, actually uh, price um, expenses will increase. Uh, but most importantly, substantial public funding is needed for similarly for the reason I told you before why the ETI uh, policy loan would not work. Uh, in the same case, if we leave the households to pay for these, let's say, improvements on their own, um, this would not work. It has, it has to be made by governments, and that's why all these funds that are available, such as the Social Planet Fund, uh, need to be spent on this even though uh, it was found that additional funding and financing would be needed. And for more details, you can visit the, the, web, the URL here. Um, but yeah, if we move to the next slide, uh, then 
I will tell you your blessing. Okay. All right. So in this so one, um, okay. So in uh, from this slide on, we can see the percentage the evolution of the final energy consumption uh, for uh, for the seven countries that we're ex examining. And you can see mainly what we are interested in is scenario one, so the gray one, uh, which is the ETS two, and uh, on the dark blue. So the next one is the uh, scenario with a combination of the policies. This seems to be now the most realistic ones, given that we do have the existence of the ETS two already kind of approved. So what you see there is indeed as Marco mentioned that uh, we have a reduction in the final energy consumption under the ETS2, which is logical because the prices will increase due to the CO, the extra CO2 price, and um, somehow this will this will uh, uh, actually add up to a so greater social problem because it will not be accompanied by structural effects. The reason for that is that there will be thermal comfort loss from this um, increase of uh, of the costs, as uh, we assume and what we have seen in reality is that the low income households, so the households of the first income quintile, are the ones who don't have access to the financial markets. So in essence, they cannot co-finance such investments. This means they would require a 100% subsidy rate and we'll see afterwards. And then for the, in contrast, what we see in the scenario at one and five, sorry, which is the combination of, uh, of all this policy, we see that indeed we have a higher, we have a yeah, larger reductions of uh, final energy consumption, but here we know that there is a structural effect taking place because we do have energy efficiency upgrades of uh, the households, we have heat pumps and practically um, the, uh, this will result in a better uh, life for um, and more comfortable life for the low income households. On the right part, we see the energy expenses, meaning so that what the extra costs will be in terms of percentage uh, rate and we see in the evolution and we see that in the scenario one, uh, for most of the countries, uh, we have uh, um, actually a higher energy expense uh, due to the costs of, uh, of the extra CO2. Uh, and as we said, this has to do, of course, with the degree that um, we have fossil fuel heating in the overall heating uh, parts in, uh, in these countries. And um, in essence, countries with a higher heating fuel, yeah, well, let's say fossil fuel share in, uh, in their heating in the buildings will have a higher cost, uh, provided that they don't change uh, to when they don't shift to cleaner fuels or electrification quicker. While in the scenario five, um, we have a reduction actually in all the energy expenses as expected due to the role of the energy efficiency upgrades and also the changes to heat pumps. Now, uh, the financing requirements and the impact effects, the income effects, that's an important element because we have to see how the whole thing will be funded. If we assume that, um, uh, that uh, the funds uh, will be there to uh, finance these extra costs um, yeah, for the ETS2, for the heat pumps and for the energy efficiency upgrades, uh, and if this comes from, uh, and so this financing comes from external financing from the EU, mainly the other national sources, then uh, we see that we have a change in income, a positive change in income in most of uh, the efficiency scenarios. So like if you take the scenario five or the scenario three or the scenario four, while we have a decrease of the income uh, still for the countries, uh, for like Czech, Greece and Romania, uh, if it's only the ETS2. So there we have a large, uh, much larger problem. Now, if of course uh, the funding comes from uh, the households itself, so if at the end of the day, the whole market structure works in such a way that households will pay for this, um, all the policy evolutions, meaning the ETS2, as we said, the removal of uh, fossil uh, heating and also the, um, the maps, then practically will have a much larger um, decrease in uh, of the income uh, from uh, for the households in the long run. Still, what we have now to take into account is that uh, despite um, the social climate funds and to some extent uh, the the auctions from the ETS uh, as they are being projected from the ETS as they are being projected by the studies we have used, uh, parts of the uh, RRFs. Uh, where we know that there is a kind of a, a percentage of uh, 20 to 30 percent in most of the RRFs on energy efficiency and energy related aspects. But while there is mention of um, priority for vulnerable consumers and low and um, energy poor groups, we still don't have exact figures of how much this will be attributed. So this is quite an important element to be added to the RRFs. We also have the just transition funds where there's a small portion attributed to that, to the um, energy efficiency upgrades, plus uh, other types of funds. Uh, still, what we see is that the costs outweigh 
the revenues. And this is a very serious issue to be discussed because even for the first period 2025-2013, with all these funds, we see that the revenues are not enough to finance the costs, while which is about 50%. While for the second period 2030-2040, with all the changes made, the revenues are even less, about four, they can cover up to 40%. The problem with that is that um, it seems that uh, there should be a lot of recalibration of uh, the funds, mainly from the RRFs and from the other sources, to capture to a great extent this gap. Also from the Repower EU and all this type of funding that will come. So uh, all the funds should come as front-loaded as possible to um, carry out the investments required now in 2025-2030, because don't forget that most of these funding um, streams actually they have an end date in 2030. Uh, then, uh, the next part, uh, if you can see that the, the, when you compare the various studies, uh, the two studies, the one now and the one before, with due to the change of the prices, uh, we see that the costs, uh, of course, vary. This is quite normal. Of course, you have to keep in mind that with a higher cost, with higher energy costs, the benefits will be also higher for the households, and this has to be very well communicated. Coming back to, to the end, uh, it's the recommendations. Uh, what we have, uh, what we could come up and from uh, could generate from the study. The first one is that um, we need really to move on much quicker. So for the for the phasing out of, uh, of the fossil fuel boiler and uh, the clean heating systems before 2025. This practically has to do with two reasons. First of all, is the lifetime of the boilers, which is about 20 to 20, 20 years more or less. So it would take much more time uh, to change that. And plus, we have to keep in mind that. Uh, uh, several, uh, uh, let's say, the, I would say, even the big, big share of the low income groups um, do not actually uh, change the heating unless it is being completely out of functioning. Yeah? We have that's a reality, and this would require much more uh, care. Then we also have got lots of member states who are financing still uh, fossil fuel heating, and they even finance upgrades, boiler upgrades uh, within natural gas or oil. Uh, within their finance uh, streams, as we saw before. So a big part of the RRF does not go really for uh, changing to clean heating, but also upgrading the existing fossil fuel heating. So that's even worse looking for um, for the low-income households. Then we must have this year marked budget with maximum funding rate. As we explained before, if we don't go for a 100% financing rate for the low-income groups, it would never probably work. Um, because they are, they don't have access to the finance market. Uh, also, we have to keep in mind that um, in several of the countries, if we have the private rented sector, for instance, a low-income household lives in a place which belongs to a low-income landlord. So none of them can invest uh, if they don't get very high subsidy rates. Then um, we link up this debate to the Article 3 of the Energy Efficiency Directive, the, so the Energy Efficiency First Principle, where here it makes really a lot of sense to put it in place and check and prioritize the investments on the demand side versus the supply side. Here what we see is that indeed the minimum energy performance standards and the efficiency uh, type of actions would really uh, outweigh the cost, especially if we take into account also the multiple benefits. So this needs a very serious communication on the role of the multiple benefits. Uh, the fourth one is that um, uh, if we have all measures together, this is a correct signal and this can generate uh, structural effects on the consumption and the cost for the low income groups. So one policy alone would not work out. We see that the phasing out of the fossil boilers in the medium run um, is a very cost effective solution, but still in order to have everything uh, on time and give the correct signal for energy efficiency upgrades, these three policies should start uh, together. And then the, uh, the two last ones, the first one is the social climate fund the revenues from the auctions and the uh, funding streams from the RRFs must be revisited. Uh, and we must secure that there is clear uh, earmarked amount to the low income groups. So not only arriving to the energy poverty, the reason is that the funds we showed before and the distance between the costs and the revenues would be much, much higher if we take into account that the social climate fund is not only for the low income groups, but for energy poverty in general. And under energy poverty, we know that in most of the countries is not only the first income quantile, but also the second, not to say sometimes the third. So this would mean that the cost for the investments of more people, so more families belonging to the other income groups would be enormous in comparison to the revenues, which would be the same. And then um, the EU regulations, especially in this matter, should better focus and better address the behavior of the low income groups. And here comes one magic word, the word elasticity. Uh, as Marco said before, we have the assumed the elasticity from the national uh, 
countries. And uh, this kind is an of an average elasticity for all households. But we do know that elasticities are not the same, especially now we see it even more from the higher energy prices for the low income groups. So here it needs better insight, better prices to be 100% sure that these are uh, the correct uh, behavioral uh, changes from the um, households. Because if we assume that the households can on their own uh, change their behavior due to a new price stimulus, so new to carbon, uh, due to the new higher car price of carbon, we know that in the end this could be very risky and it could not work. Thank you very much for, um, for your patience and here you can find the link when you share the study uh, to download it and we are at your disposal for any other questions. In case there are questions, you can raise your hand so that I unmute you because I think you are forced uh, to be muted, but I can unmute you one by one if you have questions for Blazis or Marco. Thanks. Yeah, there is a question from Mr. Dein Kron. Yes, you can use your microphone now. Great, thanks. And um, thank you for the presentation. Thanks for the great pronunciation of my first name. Indeed, that's uh, Tijn Kroon from the TU Delft. Um, so quick clarification uh, question. Uh, you uh, referred to the uh, third quantile uh, with regard to energy poverty. How would you define energy poverty? Um, and how do you see the, the concept um, in relation to the uh, targeting of the social climate uh, plans. Thanks. Good point. Uh, thank you very much, Stein. So uh, the reason why we didn't select energy poverty is to avoid all the biases, because we understand that energy poverty, as per se, it can be very much biased and it depends on so many different indicators as we all work on, which uh, it will be quite difficult to find a unanimous uh, consent, let's say, on what to use. That's why we prefer to use the low income, the, the, the income quantiles, which is safer and it's being and it's being clear and kind of more agreeable in the way due to the Eurostat. So, uh, for uh, if we refer to um, the social climate fund, social climate fund, in the way that's being said, it refers to energy poverty. And it refers to vulnerable groups, energy poverty. So it's quite broad so far, and it would need really a lot of digging to find out per country what these percentages will be. There are some definitions uh, to help out and that provided also under the um, Energy Efficiency Directive uh, with the new articles, uh, also for the Article 8 and the Article on Energy Poverty, where they have, uh, in order to have the final energy savings targets, there are um, there is a proposal for three indicators that member states can use. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, we did not deal with energy poverty in this part, you know, explicitly in the, in the strict uh, sense of the word, uh, and rather we focused on the low and the first uh, income quantiles. Uh, what I mean that uh, we have a higher, uh, or we could have, let's say, energy poverty if we use the utility on, on, um, on bills, uh, so the areas on utility bills, or the, for instance, the income indicators. Yes, we do have, we could assume that we have higher uh, energy poverty uh, numbers also in the third income quantile, especially in countries that were severely hit from financial crisis. Uh, and they are also, uh, uh, they have a higher share of fossil fuel heating because there the price for heating are much higher and uh, also the wholesale and the retail. And this, um, and this actually could somehow simulate that this uh, or that all three um, incomes and income groups could have problem. But of course, it needs to be seen. Eh? And that's why we stick to the first income quantile, which is for sure the one uh, having the severest uh, issues. Thanks. OK, then there is something about the link. The link we have, uh, the link will be shared also in the presentation so you can uh, you can download it. Yes, Roxana, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much for this really, really insightful uh, presentation, especially so shortly after the announcement of uh, the ad adoption of ETS2. So thanks a lot. A quick question because you've mentioned on um, on the third slide, the main findings from, from the study that there will be one third cost reduction with MEPS in category D. And so that, that that's a bit surprising, uh, would have expected a bit more. And so this also raises the question of the baseline energy price that you used. Uh, if you could uh, shed more light on this, please. Thank you. Yes, for the, for the baseline energy price, perhaps I can show it once more. 
here. Um, so for the baseline energy price, because that's really always a total mystery on uh, where to start from, we start from the 2019 and we used the uh, scenarios from the uh, from the European Commission that were sent to the member states for the as a guidance for updating their national energy and climate plans. You know, if you have followed this debate, in you can see this um, yeah, top uh, bottom right. Uh, so uh, in the um, if you have followed all this debate on the repower EU, there were the first prices uh, provided, which were much uh, lower than the existing gas prices. So the EU has provided these new uh, updates some a couple of months, I think, ago, uh, where you can see the evolution of um, and what it will be on the gas, oil, and uh, coal price. And uh, I, it seems to be quite on a more logical basis. So here is what we have assumed in the previous study. Uh, which was, uh, as Marco said, we used the lower price because we conducted last year. So we had indeed much lower prices on, and it's, uh, it was based on the reference scenario. But now I think it's safer that we move on uh, with um, with the prices provided. And we see. But uh, also one second on this on the prices, I should say that since the agreement on the ETS2 is on the 45, uh, it was a ceiling price 45 euros per ton of CO2. We have assumed kind of, um, you know, a low and then higher price. It's about 50 euros per ton of CO2. It was in about 2035. And somehow, so we are again in the same line of what the Commission has proposed. Uh, then uh, for um, your question then was again also about the um, the maps, the minimum energy performance standards, as I realize. Yeah, um, we have assumed the the, the class D in 2030, and uh, which somehow we about 75% of the total should renovate the buildings, and uh, in 2035 would be renovating up to class C. Uh, yeah, okay. The cost, of course, is something we have here. It could be reasonably debated. Now it's 15,000 euros. We assume economies of scale. Uh, at some point, it should work, come down to 10,000 euros. This is extra, and uh, the savings would be on the 10%. But this is, if coming to where this comes from, normally this all reflects a bit also the evolution of the prices we have here. Thank you. I think the, the question was also. Yeah, I, if I could also add. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, Marco, please. No, I just want to quickly say because uh, Roxana also asked, uh, was surprised by the number. Uh, the, the the 30 percent uh, in um, in 2050, 50. Uh, but also uh, I wanted to say in the first study um, actually we did not take class D and C, but we took class E and D. So that's also maybe why uh, the the savings were let's say lower than you would uh, think. So just to keep that in mind that uh, in the previous study we assumed first to make them class E and then D, whereas here we improved the two class D and then C. And just that. All right, so uh, thank you then very much for attending. Uh, the, um, in the next uh, year, we'll be having again a series of uh, uh, several um, Land seminars. It will be in the 20 minutes where you can also ask questions and it will be findings uh, from uh, our projects that we run for the European uh, Union. Thank you very much for that and uh, wishing you all the best for the Christmas break and the new year. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.